Hello everyone and thank you for taking the time out of your day to view this presentation on the topic of information security in the workplace. But before we get started, my name is Eric Chrisman and I'm a network engineer with Huff Technologies in Jacksonville, Florida. My focus is on both wired and wireless networking and also network security. I will be talking about the primary internet threats that you might encounter and the things that you can do to help protect yourself and your company from these threats. Now I understand that the information here may be familiar to you, especially considering all the media coverage on the importance of information security. But my hope is that you will be able to take something away from this presentation that will help you to protect your company and yourself from these internet threats. So why are internet threats a concern for you and your company? Well, for several reasons. Malware can slow your PC and your company's network. It does this by bogging down your computer's system resources and causing your computer to run slow. Internet threats can also put you and your company at risk by exposing your sensitive personal information. Think account numbers, passwords, and any confidential personal or company information. Internet threats can result in data theft, corruption, or even loss of your data entirely. And internet threats cost time and money. Some examples of this are in repairs and uh, repairing the damage done to the computers. Uh, recovering the data costs time and money. Then there is also the loss of productivity since it is difficult to get work done with a slow or damaged computer. In addition, internet threats can damage company reputation and brand. I'm sure that most of you remember hearing about the TJ Maxx security breach that occurred back in 2007, right? Well, this breach resulted in the compromise of customer credit card information, which in turn resulted in damage to the company's reputation and brand, not to mention it had a very significant financial impact. In fact, it is estimated that this one incident cost TJ Maxx a total of $256 million or more. So why should you care? Isn't this IT's job? Well, yes, of course, this is our job. And we do have multiple security layers in place in order to protect you and your company from threats. But the fact is that you are in a great position to help us keep it secure. You are on the front lines. So you make decisions every day, like whether or not to download a mysterious email attachment or to click on a tempting pop-up window. Because of this, you are all in an excellent position to help us maintain the security of your computer and your company's network. Another reason you should care is that this information applies to more than just a workplace. It can help you to protect your home computer from threats and damage. It can help you to protect your personal online accounts, such as webmail, banking, and credit cards. This information can help you to protect your personal information too. And it can even help you to protect your personal identity. This slide shows the results of a study performed by Symantec back in 2013. And it is interesting because it shows the major causes of data breach. You can see here in the green and blue areas of the pie chart on the left that both malicious attacks and negligence or human error combined accounted for over 70% of the major data breaches globally. And this is an important study for us to consider because it illustrates just how important it is for all of us to be educated on internet security so that we can make choices that will help protect ourselves against over two thirds of the causes of data breaches. It's all about balance. The purpose of this slide is to show that there is a balance between usability and security of a system. You can see that as we increase the usability of a system, the security tends to go down. And this is true because most of the time, the easier a system is to use, the less secure or protected it is. For example, imagine that you had no password on your computer and no password on your email accounts at all. You could see that this would make it very easy to turn on your computer and access your email, very high usability. But this would not be very secure at all, very low security. So because of this inverse relationship between security and usability, this is a challenge for us as information security professionals. We wanna protect you and your data, but not to the point where the usability is so low or diminished that it is too negatively affects your ability to use the systems. So this is where you come in. The idea here is that the more you, you can do to keep yourself secure, the more usable the systems can be. 
Now we will talk about threat types. So the goal today is to learn about the three major types of threats that you might face. And after that, I will talk about the things that you can do to protect the company's network and yourself from these threats. The three threat types are physical access, malware, and social engineering. So now let's take a look at each of these threat types in more detail. The first threat type is physical access. This is when an attacker gains unauthorized physical access to your computer. For example, the attacker could just walk up to your computer while you're away from your desk. And at that point, he could install malicious software on your computer that is capable of stealing your data. Or the attacker could use your email account to forward data from your computer to an outside account. Or he could even copy data off of your computer by using a portable USB flash drive. Or perhaps that attacker just steals the whole computer, in which case he would have the computer and all the data on it. The second threat type we talk about is malware or malicious software. Examples include viruses, worms, rootkits, Trojan horses, ransomware, spyware, adware, scareware, and key loggers. So malware is bad for several reasons. For one, it can slow or damage your computer. It can also hold your data ransom, which is where you have to pay a ransom to hopefully get it back. Or it can just completely destroy your data. Malware can also spy on your computer use and what websites you visit. And it can even log the keystrokes on your keyboard, capturing your login information and passwords as you type them in. The third threat type we will discuss is social engineering, which is also known as human hacking. So this is a method of gaining access to information, data, physical work settings, and systems by exploiting human psychology rather than by physically breaking in or using technical hacking techniques. Social engineering is many times the easiest way for an attacker to gain access to systems and sensitive information. So it is important to be aware of and protect yourself from this threat. Examples of social engineering include impersonation, which is when an attacker pretends to be someone else, such as building maintenance, the cleaning crew, or even IT support staff. Impersonation can be done over the phone or in person. In this example, in this photo here, you can see that this guy is impersonating IT support. If he gains this employee's trust, he may be able to walk her through granting him remote access to her computer or providing him with other sensitive information. Other examples of social engineering include shoulder surfing, which is when an attacker looks over one's shoulder to gain information, tailgating, this is where an attacker follows close behind someone to gain physical access to a restricted area. This attacker may hold the door for you and follow you in acting as if they belong there. Dumpster diving, which is basically just going through your trash. Then we have phishing, which is an attempt to get you to provide personal or financial information by pretending to be a legitimate party. We'll talk more about that later and baiting, which is when an attacker loads information stealing software onto portable media such as CDs or USB flash drives and then leaves these in areas that employees frequent, such as the employee parking lot, in the hopes that employees will pick these up and connect them to the company computers. So now we will go over the things that you can do to protect your company's network and yourself from these threats. The topics here include protecting your computer, using caution when sharing sensitive information, be secure when browsing the internet, protecting yourself from email threats, password security best practices, and protecting your data on the go. Be sure to keep your computer operating systems and programs current and updated. This includes Windows and Microsoft updates. These software updates often include patches for security vulnerabilities, and if these updates are not done, your computer may be vulnerable to malware and other exploits. Use antivirus software and be sure it is always active and updated. So here at Huff Technologies, we offer a managed service. 
in which our customers' computers receive Windows updates automatically. This managed service also monitors the computers for hardware and performance issues on the machine. In this screenshot, you can see the HuffTech icon in the left of the system tray with the antivirus software icon just to the right of that. In this case, the antivirus software happens to be ESET. If your computer is under a HuffTech managed contract, it is important to be sure that these icons are always there and clean with no alerts. An X or an alert on one of these icons indicates an issue with the service. If you notice or suspect any issues, please inform your on-site contact. And if you don't have the HuffTech managed services on your computer, it is important that you update your computer and antivirus software regularly. Web browser updates. It is important that your web browsers are kept up to date. This includes web browsers such as Internet Explorer, Firefox, and Chrome, to name a few. Most web browsers automatically update themselves, but they may prompt you to actually run the installation of the update after the update is automatically downloaded, so you want to be sure to pay attention to this. Most web browsers also include protection against malware and phishing websites, and fortunately, this protection is enabled by default. It is also important to be sure to keep all of your other software up to date as well. And this includes any free software, such as Adobe Reader, Java, and Flash. When you install free software, it is important that you pay very close attention during the installation process. In this slide, you can see a screenshot taken during the installation of Java. The checkboxes you see on the left here are checked by default and will install other software and make changes your, to your computer that you do not necessarily want. So be sure that you uncheck these boxes and pay close attention during the installation of Java and any other free software for that matter. Only install company approved software on your work computer. You can check with your on-site contact if you are unsure if a particular piece of software is company approved or not. You should also be sure to use extreme caution when downloading and installing free software found on the internet onto your computer. This is because there are instances when the freeware is bundled with hidden malware. And this hidden malware can be used to steal your data, including your account credentials. Another way to protect your computer is to lock your computer every time before you walk away from it. Examples would be before going to lunch, taking a coffee break, or even just stretching your legs. Lock your computer. Very important. As you can see in this image, a shortcut for locking a Windows-based computer is to hold down the Windows key while clicking the L key at the same time. Your computer will now be locked, which can prevent people from physically accessing your data while you are away from it. Reboot your computer every day before you go home. This is an important practice for a couple of reasons. One is that many of the updates that our HuffTech managed service agents automatically push out to your computer require a reboot in order to completely install. If you don't reboot, the updates won't get installed promptly, which could leave your computer vulnerable to unpatched security threats. Rebooting your computer also helps it to run faster by freeing up memory and system resources. So, before you go home every day, save your work and reboot your computer. And be sure that you leave it at the login prompt instead of logging back into it, as this will reduce the likelihood of an unauthorized user having access to your computer after you leave the office. Next, we will go over the topic of using caution when sharing sensitive information. So, what is sensitive information? Sensitive information is any information that is confidential in nature. Examples of sensitive information include usernames and passwords, account and credit card numbers, medical records, social security numbers, and any confidential company information. So next we will talk about things that you can do to protect your sensitive information. One thing is do not send sensitive information in response to an email or IM request. This is because regular email is sent in the clear or not encrypted. So email is subject to interception by hackers. It is important to note here that there are ways to send secure or encrypted email messages, but unless you have deliberately set this service up, email should be treated as unsafe for use in sending any sensitive information. 
Another reason to not send sensitive information via email is that there is no way for you to be sure that your intended recipient is the one that actually received the email. You should also look for signs that a website is safe before entering any sensitive information on it. You can see in this image that the website is HTTPS. The S stands for secure. Very important to remember. You should never enter sensitive information at a website that only shows HTTP in the address bar, as this is not secure at all. See, I know most of you might already know this stuff, but it never hurts to review, so hang in there. Next, we will talk about being secure when browsing the internet. And we will also see a few examples of both safe and unsafe websites and compare them with each other. So, is the website you are at safe? And how can you be sure? One way you can protect yourself when browsing the internet is to pay attention to the website name up in the address bar. Does the name in the address bar match the site you think you are at? Check the spelling of the name to be sure, since you wouldn't want to enter your login information on the wrong website. Also, once again, be sure to check for the S before you enter any sensitive information on a website. It needs to read HTTPS. Never enter sensitive information on a website that does not have HTTPS in the address bar. Also, do not bypass SSL certificate errors. I will go over an example of this in a moment, so hang in there. So here we have an example of a PayPal phishing website. A phishing website is one that is pretending to be a legitimate company's website in order to trick you into providing login or financial information. You can see in this example that the website looks exactly like PayPal's website. But you can see that up in the address bar circled in red, the URL is not PayPal at all. Sometimes the misspelling is very obvious, as you see in this example, but many times the misspelling may be minor and a lot more difficult to detect. There is another issue with this website other than the name and the address bar, and that is that it is only HTTP and not HTTPS. Remember, the S stands for secure, so if there's no S, the website is not secure, and you should not enter your login information. Really driving that point home, right? Here we have an example of a legitimate website. It is American Express's login page. You can see the HTTPS circled here in the upper left of the address bar, and you can also see that the website's URL up in the address bar is spelled correctly. The other important thing to notice here is the little padlock circled here on the right side of the address bar. The padlock means that this website uses an SSL certificate that was validated by a third party. In this case, that third party is VeriSign. You want to be sure that any HTTPS website has this padlock. The SSL certificate, along with a private and public key, is what actually encrypts and secures the communication between your computer's web browser and the web server you are visiting. In this example, you can see that I have moused over the padlock in order to view the issuer of the certificate. You can also click the padlock for even more information if you like. But the main things I want you to be aware of here is that we have HTTPS in the address bar, the website name is spelled correctly, and the lock is clean, indicating that it is secured by a trusted third-party SSL certificate. So this page shows an example of a website with an untrusted SSL certificate. Up in the address bar, I typed HTTPS colon slash slash www.amex.com, which sounds like it might be a legitimate website for American Express. But as you can see here, the padlock has an X on it. Not only that, but the page displayed here is warning you that the site is not private and that attackers might be trying to steal your information. In this case, you should click the back to safety button on the bottom right of the page, or better yet, just click the back button in your web browser or just close the tab at the top. You do not want to try to continue to this website because there is no way for you to know whether the site is safe or not. When browsing the web, it is important to pay attention to any pop-ups or alerts and be aware of what you are agreeing to when you click. An example of this is that cyber criminals have used fraudulent Adobe Flash and Adobe Reader pop-up alert updates in order to trick the user into installing what appears to be a software update. For example, the user is on a website and then sees 
the pop-up saying that they need to install a flash update. But this might not be a flash update at all. And it might instead install a Trojan or other malicious software onto your computer. The best practice in these situations is to ignore these website alerts and just down the software update from the manufacturer's website instead. Next, pay attention to any warnings or alerts in your web browser. So, most web browsers have built-in protection against malware and phishing attacks. And this protection is enabled by default, as I mentioned earlier. Internet Explorer's version of this protection is called Smart Screen Filter. But both Firefox and Chrome and other web browsers also have this built-in protection. This is an example of the built-in malware and phishing protection in the Internet Explorer's web browser called Smart Screen Filter. It is very important that if you see a page like this, that you do not attempt to bypass this and visit the web page, even if you are just curious. This is because the website can infect your computer just by you visiting it. This type of malware is called drive-by malware. With drive-by malware, just visiting the website can infect your computer, even if you do not click on or download anything. So what should you do if you come across a page like this? Just get out of there, either by clicking on your web browser's back button or just closing out the tab on the top. This is an example of a malware and phishing block page in a Firefox browser. Once again, just click your browser's back button or click the get me out of here button at the bottom of the alert. Never attempt to continue to the infected website by clicking ignore this warning. Another thing you can do to be secure when browsing the internet is to think before you click. That is because clicking unfamiliar links can expose you to malicious software. You can just hover your mouse over the link to see what the address actually is before you click it. The next one is a big one. Slow down. The simple act of taking your time can really help you to protect your computer from threats. Many times we are in a hurry, so we just click, click, next, OK, etc. You get the idea. Just keep in mind that a computer bogged down with junk applications or malware can slow you down significantly. So it is best to just keep this stuff off of your computer to begin with by just taking your time when it comes to clicking links. The less garbage on your computer, the faster and more secure it will be. Only download applications and their updates from reputable sources. And as I mentioned earlier, if you are visiting a website and it prompts you to download and install a Java, Adobe, or some other update, don't do it. Instead, go to the Java, Adobe, or other website yourself to do the update. In this section, we will talk about protecting yourself from email threats. Many threats to security come to you in your inbox. We will now go over the various types of email threats and what you can do to protect yourself against them. Email threats include spam, email spoofing, email scams, phishing, and malware, both attachments and links. Spam. We all know what spam is. Let's face it, if you haven't experienced spam, then you must not be using email. Spam is defined as unsolicited or junk email. Approximately 95% of all email on the internet is spam. Why is spam bad? Well, for several reasons. For one, the cost is borne by the recipient. In addition to the money it costs to deal with spam, dealing with spam also costs time and resources. Spam also causes distraction and clutter in your inbox. And another issue with spam is that it may also contain malware. At Huff Technologies, we provide a spam filtering service that blocks 99.7% of all spam. Notice, I did not say that our service blocks 100% of all spam. There is no spam filtering service that filters 100% of spam. So if a spam message does get through, do not click on links in the email or open any attachments in the email. Also, do not reply to spam messages. If you reply, you are only confirming to the spammers that you are there and have received and read the email. They will just send you more spam. Just delete any spam that does happen to get through. 
Oh, and if you do have the HuffTech spam filtering service, you can also just manually add the sender's email address or even the domain name to the spam filter. This way you do not receive spam from that sender's email address or domain ever again. Next, we talk about email spoofing. Spoofing is when an attacker is pretending to be someone that you know. The email can appear to come from a family member or friend or even yourself. Now we look at a few of the characteristics of spoofing. Spoofing is easy to do. Spoofing targets you to get your money or sensitive information. Spoofed email may also contain attachments or links in the hopes you will click the link or open the attachment, infecting your computer with malware. You should never reply to a spoofed email. Instead, just delete it. And if you are ever unsure if a particular email was spoofed or not, you can always call the sender to confirm with them whether or not they actually sent the email. Another type of email threat is called the email scam. Perhaps you have received one of these emails saying, you have millions of dollars waiting for you in an account in Africa. It is worth noting that these email scams often contain spelling and grammatical errors, and they usually have a sense of urgency. You can see an example of an email scam on the right in this slide here. It offers the recipient 20% of $4.2 million for their help. This sounds great, right? Yes, but it is obviously just a scam and is targeting the user for their money or information. The next email threat that we talk about is the phishing email. A phishing email is an email message claiming to be from a company you may trust. This is usually a bank or other financial institution. If you recall, phishing email falls into the social networking category of threat types since it targets people instead of technology. The phishing email is often very difficult to detect since it will often look exactly like a legitimate message. It may use the same colors, the same company logo, and even the same from address in the email. The email is oftentimes threatening. It may say something like, we will suspend or cancel your account if you do not comply. It is important to remember that emails asking you to log into a site to confirm personal details are always fake. So what should you do, or better yet, not do, if you receive a phishing email? For one, never click any of the links in a phishing email. Clicking these embedded URLs could expose your computer to malware. If you are unsure, you can also hover over the link to see if it matches what the link says it is. I mentioned this before in the web browsing section when talking about phishing websites, and it also applies here. But to be honest, it really doesn't matter whether the link name matches the redirect or not. You really should not click links in these emails at all, because it is oftentimes difficult to distinguish a legitimate email from a phishing email. Never download or open attachments in a phishing email. Once again, there is a huge risk of malware here. Never reply to an email with personal information. And this applies regardless of whether the email is a phishing email or not, because if you recall from earlier, regular email is sent in plain text and should never be used to send sensitive information. Also, if you are concerned about the threats in the phishing email because they just seem too convincing to ignore, you could just manually type in the company's website in the address bar of your web browser to visit the website manually. You can also use saved trusted bookmarks, or you can also call the company to confirm the claims in the email. It is also worth mentioning here that many large companies also have an abuse department that you can forward any suspected fraudulent emails to in order to help them in the fight against this criminal activity. For example, the United States Postal Service's email address to report abuse is fraud at usps.com. We will now take a look at a few examples of phishing emails so we can become better familiar with their characteristics. As you can see, this email looks exactly like it was from Bank of America, and it sounds very convincing. We have noticed invalid login attempts to your account, and it goes on to say that the account is temporarily suspended and that you must reactivate your account by clicking the sign-in link on the page. But if you were to actually hold your mouse pointer over this link, without clicking it, of course, 
you would see that the website the link redirects to is not Bank of America at all. It is a phishing website attempting to persuade you into entering your Bank of America login information there. And if you were to attempt to log in here, the hacker would capture your credentials and could then use them to log into your bank account and attempt to transfer or withdraw your funds. This email is supposedly from PayPal, and it looks very convincing. Even the from address looks okay. But it is important to remember that the from address in an email can be spoofed. So we cannot rely on this information to determine whether this email is legitimate or not. So next we have an email claiming to be from the United States Postal Service. It says that they have a package that could not be delivered and provides a link to click in order to reschedule the delivery. You can see at the top of the email that the from address is not from USPS.com at all and actually reads cloudvps.com. Not that we would actually rely on this anyway since the from address of an email can easily be spoofed. You can also see here circled in red that when I held my mouse over the hyperlink, I could see that it actually redirected to a site other than the USPS website. So this email is definitely a fake. And at this point, I can just delete it. Or if I want to help out, I could first forward it to the USPS abuse department email address and then delete it after that. This is an email that says it's from the IRS. There are several things wrong with this email, including spelling and grammatical errors. The email also has a zip file attached, and it asks you to download the file and print it out, filling in the requested information. But what the zip file attachment actually contains is malware. Do not open it. Now we move along to password security. So imagine having one key that unlocks your house, your garage, your office, and your car. And then to make sure that you always had the key handy, you made 20 copies of the key and engraved your address on every single one of them before leaving them in convenient locations. That's about the level of security you have if you use the same easy to guess password for multiple purposes. And far too many people do just that. Passwords protect your computer and every part of your online life. Unfortunately, many people choose simple passwords that can easily be guessed or have the same password for many or even all of their accounts. Here's some basic recommendations for password security. The first is that you should use a different password for each account. This may seem inconvenient, but think about it. If someone manages to steal your email password, do you want them to access your bank account too? Next is to use two-factor authentication when it's available. So for those of you that don't know what two-factor authentication is, it is exactly what it sounds like. It's when you use two means of identification when authenticating to a system. One of these factors is something that you know, such as a password, PIN, or security code. And the other factor is something that you have, such as a card, a temporary token, a one-time passcode sent to you by text or email, or even your fingerprint. A great example of two-factor authentication is a bank card. The card itself is the physical item or the thing that you have, and the PIN is the thing that you know. It is much more difficult for an attacker to compromise an account with two-factor authentication. And then we have, be careful with your password. So you never want to write down your password and then keep it in a place where it may be found. You would be surprised how many times we see people with their password written on a post-it note stuck on their monitor or stuck to the bottom of their keyboards. Never enter your password on a website that is not secure. Remember, the site must be HTTPS. HTTP without the S is not secure. Never share your password. And never email a password, even to someone that you trust. When choosing a password, you should always choose a strong password. A strong password is one that cannot be easily guessed or broken by brute force attack in a reasonable amount of time. Password recommendations include eight characters minimum. More is always better here, so feel free to go more than eight characters. Do not use common names, especially your own name. 
don't use words that are in the dictionary. And this goes for foreign dictionaries too. Passwords should contain a combination of upper and lower case letters, numbers, punctuation, and special characters. For a strong password, an excellent practice is to use a seemingly random string of characters. For example, you can use acronyms for phrases, use misspellings in your password, and you could replace vowels with symbols instead. What I like to recommend is finding a phrase that is meaningful to you so that you will remember it, and then using this phrase to come up with a strong password. So for example, here in green, I came up with a password based on the book Green Eggs and Ham by Dr. Seuss. I like green eggs and ham. Yes, I do, Sam, I am. You can see that in my password, I substituted an exclamation point for the eyes and the number three for the letter E. I used the number five for the letter S and the at sign for the letter A. As you can see, it makes for a very complex and secure password that I can easily remember. As I'm sure you all realize, it is quite difficult, if not impossible, to remember passwords that are both unique and secure for all of your accounts. And this is why I recommend using a password manager application. A password manager is a program used to encrypt and store your passwords. The one that you see here is called Password Safe, and it also happens to be the one that I personally use. It's a free open source application. It uses strong encryption and can be used to generate truly random and unique passwords for you based on rules that you set in the program. All you have to do is create and remember a single master password of your choice in order to unlock and access your entire username password list. The top 10 passwords of 2014. So this next part is just for fun. I thought you might like to see what the top 10 passwords of 2014 were. To be honest, I am not sure how they even came up with this list, but I found it on the internet, so it must be true. So anyway, here we go. Number 10, football. And you can see that this was a new one for the year 2014. 2013, football wasn't even on the list. Number nine, dragon. Number eight, baseball. So all three of these are new. Number seven, one, two, three, four. Moved up nine from the previous year. Number six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I guess the password requirements were a little higher for this one. Number five, QWERTY. Number four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Number three, one, two, three, four, five. Number two is the word password. And the number one password for 2014 was, drum roll please, one, two, three, four, five, six. Unchanged from the previous year. In this section, we talk about protecting your data when you are on the go. So these are a few of the things that you can do to help protect yourself when you are outside of the office, on your laptop or working remote. So first, you need to be sure that you do not store unencrypted sensitive data on any removable media. Removable media includes USB thumb drives or flash drives, CD-ROMs, and even floppy disks, if anybody is still using these. Next, use caution anytime you use public Wi-Fi. This is because public Wi-Fi is open and therefore not secure. If you have other options available for wireless access, such as wireless with a passphrase, paid wireless, or even a cellular service or mobile hotspot, then go with one of these options instead. They are all more secure options than open public Wi-Fi. If you do decide to use public Wi-Fi, it is important that when you connect to the wireless network that you choose the network location type called public. Choosing the network location public disables your laptop's file sharing for that particular wireless network. And since you don't want to share files on your laptop with other wireless users, it is very important that you select this location type when prompted during the wireless connection process. 
Do not enter any sensitive information when using public Wi-Fi. This is very important because the connection from your laptop to the wireless is not encrypted, and any information you enter on a website could potentially be captured by a hacker. Next, be sure to use extreme caution when using public computers. Actually, the best practice here is to never enter any sensitive information on a public computer. So many people think it's okay to use a public computer to check their email or to log into their other personal accounts, as long as they are sure that they log out of their accounts when they are finished. But this is a false sense of security. The truth is that you have no way of knowing if a public computer is secure or not. A person could have installed a key logger on the computer, and this will capture every single thing you type on that keyboard, including your login for information. And last but not least, do not let other people use your company computer. And this applies even for your own family. We see many clients that will let their kids use their company laptop or computer to play games or surf the internet. This is obviously not a secure practice since kids are oftentimes more likely to make choices that may compromise the security of your company computer. And to summarize, you are in an excellent position to protect yourself and your company's network from internet threats. If you are ever unsure of something security related or if you ever have a question, do not hesitate to ask your on-site contact to assist. They are there to help you. If they don't have the answer, they can always contact us for help. And if you ever suspect a security compromise, no matter how small, please inform your on-site contact as soon as possible. They will get in touch with us and let us know so that we can address it. If you would like any more information on the topic of internet security, you can also do an online search for staying secure online or something of that nature. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Have a great day.